Thank you for watching this video in preparation for your upcoming joint replacement surgery. My name is Dan Holtzman. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons here at Kaiser Redwood City. And if you're watching this video in preparation for your upcoming joint replacement surgery, then you've met one of the three of us, Dr. Lim, Dr. Lowry, and myself. Uh, we all specialize in doing total joint replacements, specifically hips and knees. Um, for the three of us, uh, nearly our entire elective practice is spent doing hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, we've trained all over at excellent training programs, and the reason why we put these surgeries in the hands of subspecialists is that it results in better outcomes and lower complication rates. Our goal in doing these surgeries is to get you through the procedure successfully so that your pain is improved and your function is better, as well as to get you through safely by minimizing the um, likelihood of complications uh, that can occur around the time of surgery. It takes a team to do this. There's your medical team, which includes the uh, everybody in the hospital during um, your operation, the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the physician's assistant who assists with the surgery, the nurses in the pre-op, post-op, and op, uh, post-op areas, as well as the nurses in the operating room. There's a surgical tech who assists with the operation as well. The physical therapist will work with you in the hospital. But the care doesn't stop once you leave the hospital. One of the advantages of our joint replacement program is that we have an excellent home program as well. So the physical therapists who come to the house are really continuity for us when you go home. Um, and they'll continue to provide care after you leave the hospital. The things that we do in the operating room and afterwards and taking care of our patients, um, where there's evidence to guide our decision making, we use that evidence to decide what we can do. Uh, this has everything to do with the surgical techniques that we use in the operating room, the implant choices that we make, uh, the way that we prevent infections with antibiotics and prevent blood clots with the use of uh, medications. Um, all of these things are done uh, in a best practice way using evidence to guide our decision making. Lastly, you know, where we can accommodate your values and preferences into the care process, we want to try to do that to make this process um, as easy for you as possible by um, inducing a shared decision-making model where we go through this process uh, together. This is an outline for what I'm going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about the anesthesia, surgical approaches, implants um, for the uh, hip and knee replacement surgeries. Uh, either way, the surgery itself actually takes the surgeon about an hour or so uh, to complete. The vast majority of our surgeries are done under a spinal anesthetic, probably about 95% of them. Most of our patients get a spinal anesthetic unless there's a reason not to, um, which even in patients who've had previous lumbar fusions or spine surgery, our anesthesiologists and CRNAs are often able to uh, still place the spinal. But if uh, you can't have a spinal for whatever reason, or um, if the anesthesiologist try to place a spinal but are unsuccessful in doing that, uh, then the choice is a general anesthetic. But in general, the choice is a spinal for us. Um, there's several advantages to the spinal. First, uh, there's less post-operative nausea and vomiting because you don't get any inhaled gas anesthetic. Second, uh, when you wake up from the surgery, you're still numb below the waist, so uh, your pain is less and it's easier to transition you from um, the operating room to the recovery room and make sure your pain is well managed. Um, thirdly, um, the spinal anesthetic in general is safer for patients uh, with heart or lung disease, though there are some exceptions uh, to that. Um, For patients undergoing knee replacement surgery, our anesthesiologist will also place what's called a peripheral nerve catheter. This is a procedure that's done either before or after surgery. Under ultrasound guidance, the anesthesiologist will thread a small catheter that drips numbing medication over the nerve that provides sensation over the front of the knee um, for the first several days after surgery. We don't have anything equivalent for hip replacement surgery, but for the folks having hip replacement surgery, rest assured, in general, the pain's a lot less than patients who are having knee replacement surgery. The peripheral nerve catheter will stay in for a couple of days. You'll be able to remove it yourself at home, and the physical therapists who come to the house can confirm that it was uh, appropriately removed. The most important thing to mention about these peripheral nerve catheters um, is that they don't make the pain zero. They'll help take the edge off and help enable our home discharge program that gets most of our patients home on the same day of the surgery. But if there's any confusion about the peripheral nerve catheter, please, please, please do not go to the emergency room. 
They usually uh, don't have that much familiarity with the device. It creates more confusion. And the best thing to do is either call the phone number for the anesthesiologist that's on the discharge instructions that you're sent home with after the surgery, or wait till the following morning and call the orthopedic surgery clinic uh, where we can help guide you in terms of what to do if there's any problems. If the catheter is leaking, it's not a big deal. Just place a, a towel around the area to soak up some of the medication that leaks out. It's actually not that uncommon and it doesn't mean that it's not working because some of the medication is being absorbed as well. First, we're gonna focus on knee replacement surgery. Knee replacement is done through a straight incision over the front of the knee. We enter the knee, pull the kneecap out of the way and expose the knee joint. I think of the knee replacement as more of a resurfacing than as a true replacement because you keep most of the bone and ligaments and soft tissue around the knee. What we do is we use a saw to remove the ends of the bone where the cartilage has been worn away and replace those with a metal tray on the top of the tibia or the shin bone, a metal cap on the end of the femur, which is the thigh bone, and there's a plastic liner that locks into the tibial tray and is the new smooth surface uh, with the femur that moves on top of it. All three of us, Dr. Lim, Dr. Lowry, and myself, resurface the patella, which means we cut off the undersurface of the kneecap. Not the part that you feel on your skin on the outside, but the part underneath that glides within the groove of the femur and replace it with a cemented plastic button that uh, glides within the groove of the metal femur inside the knee. All of our replacements are cemented in place uh, as opposed to hip replacement, which for us, the vast majority are done with uncemented components. All three of us, Dr. Lim, Dr. Lowry, and myself, use the Zimmer Persona knee replacement system. The Persona's been out since at least 2012 uh, and is one of the most widely used knee replacement systems in the country. It's based on a previous uh, knee replacement system called the NextGen, uh, which was out since uh, the 1990s and has an excellent track record. Uh, we use the Persona instead of the next gen because it has improvements in instrumentation as well as increased sizes up to one millimeter differences, which really allow us to fine tune the sizing and get the knee exactly right in the operating room. Now we'll switch over to hip replacement surgery. One of the hot topics in hip replacement surgery is the approach. Um, and it's important to note that a hip replacement operation is actually the same kind of basic steps throughout the entire surgery. The approach just des describes how we get into the hip joint. There's actually three main approaches used uh, in the United States to do hip replacement surgery. One is called a lateral or anterolateral approach, which we don't offer here in Redwood City. But the two most common procedures or approaches for the hip replacement procedure done in the United States are either a posterior approach or an anterior or direct anterior approach. Now there's been a lot of marketing that's gone into the direct anterior approach. Uh, over the last several years. It's been marketed as minimally invasive and a faster recovery. There's some there there, which is to say that studies have shown a slightly faster early recovery for patients who have a uh, direct anterior approach compared to posterior approach, with the patients who have a direct anterior approach being ahead of the posterior approach people by about a week for the first two to three months after the surgery, but there's no long-term differences in overall function. <clears throat> The main difference between the two is that a posterior approach curves over the buttock and has a dislocation rate of about 1%. The uh, other downside of the posterior approach is that we recommend patients follow what we call hip dislocation precautions after the surgery, which includes no crossing your legs, no deep hip flexion, or no internal hip rotation for the first three months after the surgery and then being cognizant of that lifelong. There are no specific precautions after a direct anterior approach, and the dislocation rate for a direct anterior approach is less. It's about a quarter to half a percent. The main advantage of a posterior approach is that it's a fully extensile exposure, which means you can take it from the butt all the way down to the knee and be able to see everything um, that you need to see to do surgery. So for anybody who is bigger, either obese or very muscular, the posterior approach allows for a more extensile exposure. Uh, also, anybody who's got abnormal anatomy, previous hardware, uh, hip dysplasia, which is an abnormality of the hip joint from birth and development, um, or any revision or redo surgery, I do through a posterior approach. An anterior approach is a good choice um, in straightforward operations uh, in healthier, um, thinner patients. 
Dr. Lowry and myself do both an anterior and a posterior approach. Dr. Lim does a posterior approach. Um, if you have any questions about which approach you're getting, this is hopefully something your surgeon has discussed with you during uh, the, dis the pre-op discussion, uh, but please reach out to your surgeon if any additional questions remain. And as I said, a hip replacement operation is actually more or less the same steps regardless of what the approach is. And a hip replacement really is a true replacement. Once we're inside of the hip joint, we remove the what we call the femoral head or the ball of the ball and socket joint. We then create a space in the socket that accepts a metal cup that has a roughened back surface that the bone grows into. This provides long-term biologic stability to the components. We then put one or two screws into the uh, metal socket to help hold the cup in place while the bone grows into the metal. A plastic liner then locks into the socket. The femur, which is the thigh bone, is then exposed and we place a metal stem inside the canal of the femur that again has a roughened surface on it that the bone grows onto. Then on the end of the femoral component, we put a metal or ceramic ball that forms a new joint surface with that plastic liner so that the part that moves is ceramic or metal on plastic. Between the three of us, we use several different hip systems. Uh, Dr. Lim and Dr. Lowry use predominantly Depew, whereas I use about half uh, Biomet and half Depew. Regardless, I think the differences in terms of hip replacement uh, implant design are actually more subtle, uh, and all of these implants have excellent track records over many years. We have protocols in place to help take care of our patients after surgery in order to standardize the care to ensure that our patients get the best care that they possibly can. First, patients are often worried about their pain management after surgery, and we employ a multimodal pain management regimen. This includes the spinal anesthetic and the peripheral nerve catheters for the knee replacement folks, but it also means that we use medications that are non-narcotic to try to minimize the amount of narcotics that our patients need after surgery. Narcotics obviously have been in the news quite a bit due to addiction issues that people can develop over time, uh, but they can also cause complications like constipation or confusion in patients, so we want to try to minimize the narcotic use as much as possible. All of our patients get antibiotics in the operating room before the operation, and usually one or two doses after the surgery, but we don't routinely continue antibiotics after straightforward primary hip or knee replacement surgery. All of our patients get some form of blood thinner after surgery. It can be as simple as an aspirin twice a day or more complicated like uh, warfarin or coumadin. Uh, the, blood, the choice of blood thinner is made by the surgeon for each individual patient based on that patient's risk profile. For patients who come in on a blood thinner, whether it's coumadin or Pradaxa or Eliquis, um, often we will just continue that medication after surgery, sometimes with a delay between the surgery and restarting the medication. Those instructions will be given to you after your operation. Everybody is placed on a bowel regimen, which means you're given medications to help you go to the bathroom. Um, and it's important that you take them because if you wait until you're constipated, it's too late. We usually give patients either or both colase and senna, which function as a bulk former and as uh, a laxative to um, help you get going again after surgery. Lastly, the physical therapist will work with you both in the hospital and then once you go home to ensure that you're mobilizing safely and appropriately after surgery. There are many common things that you might experience after surgery. First, fevers. We don't encourage patients to go home and take their temperature routinely after the surgery unless they're having problems. And the reason is is because fevers are common after surgery, and this can be because of either a couple reasons. One is because you had surgery and your body responds to it uh, by ramping up its immune by ramping up your immune system, and this can often result in fevers that aren't indicative of any problems. The other ish, uh, thing that can cause fevers is what we call atelectasis, which is basically you're not inflating your lungs. Our patients are given an incentive spirometer to help you inflate your lungs fully after surgery. Uh, and sometimes if you're not breathing deeply or doing your coughing exercises instructed, uh, patients will develop fevers after surgery. These in and of themselves are not worrisome as long as they resolve and are not necessarily an indication of a knee or hip infection. Nausea and vomiting are less common. Uh, now that we use predominantly spinal anesthetics, but they can still happen, um, if especially sometimes related to narcotic use. 
And constipation is also uh, something to be aware of and be aggressive about uh, trying to prevent um, as you're taking narcotics. So it's important to, to take the bowel regimen as prescribed. Urinary retention uh, is something that can happen, especially in older men with BPH or a problem uh, going to the bathroom already, but uh, is much less common with the low-dose spinals that we use and with the urinary retention protocols that we have in place in the recovery room. Memory loss in older adults, especially those with underlying um, early dementia or memory troubles, can be exacerbated around the time of surgery. And it's one of the big reasons why we try to get patients out of the hospital as soon as possible, because patients who are in the hospital often can, can experience delirium uh, if they already have some underlying dementia or memory problems. And getting patients back into their home and normal environment can help to prevent that. Sleep disturbance around the time of surgery is really common. It can happen early on because of the anesthetic and uh, the pain associated with the surgery, but oftentimes it'll continue for several months after the surgery. Almost always it gets better within the first couple of months after surgery. Drainage from the incision is common after the operation, and it's okay as long as it's within the first couple of days, but we really want that wound to be dry within about five to seven days. If it continues draining beyond that, please let our office know uh, so that we can check in with you and likely take a look at it to make sure that the drainage is slowing down and stopping. Patients often worry about pus or the smell of the incision, but really the thing that's the most um, worrisome symptom as far as a knee or hip replacement infection is concerned is persistent drainage from the incision that doesn't stop or a knee that or hip that is dry and then starts draining again. If that happens, let us know right away so that we can take a look. Leg swelling and bruising uh, is very common and can often be impressive. People will get swelling above and below their knee or involving the entire leg and they'll get bruising that tracks up and down the leg. Lastly, blood transfusion is rarely necessary. We don't pre-bank blood anymore and it's very rare that we need to give a transfusion for somebody who's having a primary, which means first time, one-sided hip or knee replacement. Recovery after surgery starts right away while you're in the hospital. And the vast majority of our patients participate in what we call our home recovery program, which is a program that we developed uh, over the course of the last several years um, and has now been so successful that we're able to successfully get about 80% of our patients home on the same day of surgery. What this involves is you come in, you have your surgery earlier in the day um, with the plan for you to discharge home later that same day. The way that it works is you come into the hospital, you go to the pre-op area, you're brought back to the operating room where the spinal anesthetic is given. Sometimes it's a general, it doesn't mean you can't go home on the same day. We get you, we do the surgery, we get you to the recovery room, the spinal or the general anesthetic wears off. <clears throat> we sit you up early, get you dangling your legs, get you eating, drinking, making sure you can go pee. The physical therapists come and work with you. And as long as you're moving around safe, you can eat, drink, go pee, we get you home on the same day. We send you home with all the same medications you'd get in the hospital, but you can give them yourself. You don't have to wait for the nurse on the floor to go grab them. <clears throat> we then send the physical therapist out the house the very next day to work with you at home. The idea is, is we wanna be able to provide hospital level care, but get you out of the hospital as soon as possible so you're at less risk for hospital associated uh, problems and infections uh, while providing the same level of care in your home. A small percentage of our patients, usually about 15 to 20 percent, will stay overnight in the hospital and then go home the following day. The reasons for this might be that those patients have more medical issues or that the surgery happens later in the day and we're just not able to get you out of uh, the hospital in time uh, before the day's over. Um, a very small percentage of our patients will go to a rehab facility. Um, the reason is, is that a rehab facility, you know, they're nursing homes. We want to try to keep patients out of nursing homes, especially uh, in the post-COVID world where nursing facilities definitely place patients at higher risk uh, for COVID-19. Skilled nursing facilities also can be associated with higher rates of infection, so it's definitely not our first choice. Occasionally, we have to, we don't have a choice and somebody needs to go to rehab. If that's the case, our patient care coordinator, who's a nurse who works on the floor and helps facilitate the discharges for our patients, will help arrange that. Um, and uh, involve patients and their family members in that decision-making process. In terms of the recovery timeline, you'll be able to put your full weight on your hip or knee replacement right away. Typically, patients will use a walker for a week or a couple of weeks and then transition to a cane for another couple of weeks, and hopefully we'll be coming off the cane by about four to six weeks after surgery. 
patients who are more impaired before surgery take longer to get off of the walker and the cane than say patients who come in not using any device. Most patients are able to do stairs to get in and out of the house right away, but if you've got stairs inside your house where you gotta go up and down and up and down, usually it takes a week or two before you're able to do that um, throughout the day multiple times. Um, for driving, if it's your driving leg, your right leg, um, then we usually recommend about four to six weeks from the surgery before you start driving. If you're having surgery on your left leg and you have an automatic, uh, you can drive as soon as you're off the narcotic medication, but you can't take pain pills and drive. That's not safe to do. Uh, in order to be able to go back and do casual activities like walking around the grocery store, it may take six to 12 weeks. You can go back to work depending on what you do somewhere around six to 12 weeks after surgery. If you have a desk job and all you gotta do is get in the building, you could go back as soon as four to six weeks after surgery. But if you have a more physical job, say you're an electrician, you're climbing ladders, crawling through crawl spaces, it may take closer to three months for you to be able to get back to work. Uh, patients being able to go back and do sports, you know, can vary a lot from patient to patient. Anywhere from three to nine months is normal. So we say six months, somewhere in the middle. I usually tell patients about four months to hit golf balls at the range, five months to uh, play the course with a cart, and six months to be able to walk the course. During your recovery, you may notice certain things. The pain and discomfort usually is the worst within the first couple of days, but after about three days, it starts to settle down. Over the course of the next week or two, it will get less and less to the point where most patients don't need to take pain medications continually throughout the day and may only be taking it before or after physical therapy. And by you know two or three weeks after surgery, your pain level should be dropping pretty significantly to the point um, where you're able to start weaning from the narcotics you know, as soon as a week or two weeks after the surgery. Numbness around the incision is really common. For patients who have a knee replacement surgery, on the outside of the incision, there's always a numb patch. That patch usually starts big and gets smaller over time, but it may be permanent. For patients who have hip replacements through a posterior approach, there's usually just a little bit of numbness around the incision. But it's important to note for those patients who are having an anterior hip replacement surgery that there is a nerve that travels over the front of the thigh, usually right next to where we make the incision, that can be stretched during the operation and result in thigh numbness or tingling. Um, usually that gets better with time, but it can be permanent. And the number of patients who are affected overall is usually about 10 to 20%. It doesn't affect muscle strength or function, but does affect the sensation over the front of the thigh um, and can be either like a numbness, tingling, pins and needles type of sensation. As we discussed earlier, leg and ankle swelling is really common. It's important to uh, elevate the leg frequently, um, especially for the first week or so after the operation. Uh, this will be in some of the later slides. Uh, knees can click. That's actually not abnormal. Um, patients will sometimes feel that, uh, but it's not a sign of something gone wrong. And then hip precautions after surgery, as we discussed, patients who have a posterior approach hip replacement surgery will have some precautions after the surgery, which are positions we tell them to avoid after the operation to help minimize the risk of a dislocation. After surgery, we'll keep tracking in various ways. First, the physical therapist will come to the house. They usually come to the house the day after your operation and will work with you at home. They come a couple times a week for the first couple of weeks after surgery, and then we'll help transition you to outpatient physical therapy, which is in the, is in the same building as our office. That physical therapy will continue depending on kind of how you're doing and can be up to you and the physical therapist. Some people like to go to physical therapy. Other people want to have as little therapy as possible. Um, and would prefer instead to do it on to do the exercises on their own. You'll come back and see your surgeon about four to six weeks after the operation. We'll check the wound, get an x-ray, make sure things are uh, progressing um, appropriately. Your primary care doctor is still your primary care doctor. So if you have any questions about managing your blood pressure or diabetes, you should contact them. But everything about the hip or knee replacement surgery, so if you have questions about pain management, about the blood thinners, about your um, surgical incision, uh, please contact us. We want to be the point person for your recovery. And then lastly, we put this here because the question gets asked a lot, but antibiotics for dental procedures. Our group is now aligned with the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and uh, American Dental Association. We are not recommending prophylactic antibiotics for healthy, low-risk patients after hip or knee replacement surgery, but any patients who are immunosuppressed or on medication that suppress the immune system, have diabetes, or have a revision or redo hip or knee replacement surgery, we are recommending antibiotics before dental procedures. If you have questions about that, you can contact us. We can send you the um, full guidelines. Uh, and um, if 
if you're one of these people who does need antibiotics, you can contact us. We're happy to prescribe them. Thank you for uh, taking the time to go through this. I hope it was helpful. If you have any additional questions, please contact your sur surgeon either by calling the office or preferably uh, through a message on kp.org. Thank you so much for your time.